morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, much, much better. All right, I figured with Sean in the room, we would at least get like twice that volume right out of the gate. But all right, well, ah, you know, with all the amazing talks going on, like in this time slot and really throughout all of DevNexus, I, I'm just grateful that you're here. So uh, good to see you. Uh, so let's, let's get started. I have a lot that I want to cover today. Uh, so if you would, please hold any questions, comments, feedback to the end. That would be awesome. Uh, if you do think of it later, no worries. That always happens to me too. I think of something 10 minutes after I walk out and go, oh, the most important question I could have had. There it is. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, ping me later. I'm perfectly happy to converse like ad nauseum about anything. It's all good. So uh, welcome to this morning's uh, session on Game of Streams, or as I like to say, how to tame and get the most from your messaging platforms. Uh, my name is Mark Heckler. I am, uh, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But I do want to point out, uh, if you notice the bottom right, VMware, that's new. Uh, until January 1st, 2nd, uh, it was pivotal, right? Uh, still on the spring team. We're still doing the same stuff we were doing before. Uh, but uh, now we have a different company that's signing our checks. And we actually have a much more complete story, which is kind of awesome, right? Uh, I'm not going to be talking about all of that. They only gave me three hours this morning. So, OK, 50 minutes, right? More or less. Good. And I, I saw a few people doing, what the heck? Uh, but, uh, but we're going to focus in a little bit today. But it is, again, we're same team doing the same thing. So not much has changed in that regard. But we do have a different logo. Uh, please make note. So um, who here has had their boss come to them at the end of the year and say, hey, a great job last year. Really appreciate all you've done. You just knocked it out of the park. Uh, I was wondering if you'd mind if I doubled your budget and then if you'd slow things down just a little bit. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, it never happens, right? If it has happened to you, by all means, please do contact me because I will submit something for a, like a government grant and we can study it and retire early, right? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, almost inevitably, we're asked to do more with less. Once in a while, we're asked to do more with the same, right? Same resources. But, but it's, it's almost a truism that uh, we will be looking for ways to be more efficient, to, be, to increase throughput, to increase utilization, things like that. Uh, so it's very important that we constantly are looking at new ways to do better. And that's kind of what this, is, this talk is about. By the way, I am a movie and TV trivia buff. Does anyone recognize this show? Parks and Rec, Parks and Rec yeah. Uh, does anyone remember? OK, next question. Do you remember the characters? John Ralphio and Tom Haverford, of course. Now, does anyone remember? This is like the super bonus round. I'll, I'll give you a shirt. The only shirt I have, though, is this T-shirt. So if anybody gets it right, I have to take it off. I'm kidding. I would never do that to you. Um, so, so does anyone remember the company they founded that this is from, this particular scene? Entertainment 720. Oh, awesome. You are my people. OK, so this is good. Uh, <laughs> Entertainment 720. I won't even ask if you know how that they arrived at that name. If you don't, you need to go back and watch Parks and Rec. If you do, as I suspect you do, life goes on. So uh, a little bit about me, and I won't belabor this point because I'm basically a boring person. Uh, I, my name is Mark Heckler, as I mentioned. I have co-authored a couple of books and um, contributed content and code to several other books, a few of which even recognize my contributions. <laughs> that was nice. Um, Anyway, I am an architect and developer, and as you might surmise from the next point where most of my expertise has been won, uh, it's uh, been in the realm of Java, right, in the Java ecosystem. So some groovy, a lot, a lot of Java. Some Kotlin. Any Kotlin fans here? There's a special little shout out to you at the end. Please don't, don't leave before you see it. Uh, but uh, I am a Java champion, a Java 1 rock star, Groundbreaker ambassador. Received a few other honors and awards that while I truly, truly appreciate, still mean I have to buy my own coffee. I don't know who I need to see about that. Actually, that's not even true anymore because I have good friends who are bringing me coffee now, which is awesome. And I do mean good friends. So keep that in mind. Uh, I am a professional problem solver, as are you or you wouldn't be here, right? This is what we do. This is kind of our, the way we're wired. We like to tease apart problems and solve them and then look for better solutions over time, right? Uh, it's a gift and a curse. Anyone recognize that quote? No monk fans, huh? Ah. Okay, presentation over. Uh, kidding. Okay. <laughs> I am a Spring developer and advocate, uh, again, with Pivotal slash VMware now. Uh, so I, I do the two things that I like to do the most in life, which is write code and talk. So for me, it works out pretty well. I am also the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. Uh, así que 
Si eres hispanohablante, déjame extender tu voz. Uh, if you are not a Spanish speaker, that's fine too. Don't leave. Uh, but if you are a Spanish speaker or you have Spanish language resources, uh, about a year and a half ago, I thought, you know, Spanish being the second or fourth, depending on who you listen to, most spoken language in the world, I felt like we could do better as, in terms of collecting and sharing resources. So I thought, hey, I can do something about that. I don't speak Spanish well. It's even worse than my English. So it's terrible, right? But I'm working, I'm learning. Um, and I'm working and learning on English too, so I appreciate your patience. But I, I created uh, springnoticias.io, uh, also springnoticias uh, Twitter account, so please follow. Please share resources, it just benefits everyone. And let me, uh, let me amplify your voice a little bit uh, and everyone wins. If you're not a Spanish speaker, that's all good. So I do have a new book that I'm working on. Uh, I'm, I'm actually deflecting a lot of travel right now as much as I can, but I uh, can't give up on DevNexus. It's an awesome, awesome event. Uh, this is due out August 1st. Uh, this is not the real cover. It is the real title, Spring Boot Up and Running. But uh, O'Reilly hasn't assigned a, an actual cover to this yet. As you know, they love to choose their animals and they spend a lot of time deliberating and picking out the perfect animal. I don't. So I figured out, I just figured I'd just create a parody cover with a running monkey because Spring Boot up and running and I'm the monkey, so it worked, right? I'm just hoping now at this point they don't stick me with this cover. We'll see. But uh, it is coming out August 1st, plus or minus a few days. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, uh, please follow me on Twitter. That's the best way to reach me. I did, shouldn't, uh, I should have mentioned that uh, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, I am reachable by email, which I'll share at the end again. Uh, but the best way to reach me is on Twitter, MK Heck. Uh, if you don't follow me on Twitter, first, why? Uh, second, please follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's where I make all the announcements. I talk about code, coffee, any of the good stuff in life, right? So with that, let's launch. So uh, why? Why use messaging platforms in the first place? Uh, so I like to, I love history as well. And I like to go back to a little bit of a history lesson. And I'm going to try to keep um, the, the background fairly short, but I want to make sure that we have adequate context, right? Because context is important for everything we do in life. So for starters, why would we go to a distributed architecture in the first place? Now, most of us work with or have worked with monoliths, right? And monoliths kind of get a bad name, but let's face it, many, many monoliths are existing in the world that bring our companies a large amount of revenue, which not to sound crass, when our companies make money, we get paid, which means we can eat and sleep indoors. I'm rather fond of those two things, right? So that's a good thing in general. But, um, but we typically have or are dealing with monoliths. And monoliths, like every other architectural choice, have pros and cons. One of the big cons with monoliths is scalability. And you'll find after you've chatted with me for very long, I love analogies. So I, I like to take a simple example and build it out. That's what we're gonna do now. So if you were an online retailer, we'll call it, let's say you started an online retail establishment, we'll call it Amazon, right? Because we don't want any copyright infringements. So let's say you're Amazon and you create a monolith to serve as your online retail application, your back end, and basically your front end too. Let's, let's, let's bring it all together, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So in your monolith, you'll have certain modules. So you'll have a catalog module and a, an order module and a shopping cart module and a shipping module and a credit module and an inventory module and a returns module, right? So you have all this bundled into a single monolithic application. Now, welcome to Black Friday. Your volume just went way, way, way up. How do you deal with that? Well, you scale, right? You pick up your monolith and you create another monolith. So you have two monoliths running. Now, setting aside all the issues that can come with contention and things like that that happen when you scale things that weren't in, ever in, envisioned to scale, right? That you didn't expect to have two or five or 10 instances of. Let's just ignore all that for a moment. What you find is that you're bringing along a lot of baggage that you don't necessarily need to scale, right? Because your order, again, going back to Black Friday, maybe step back a little bit further even. If you've done your homework, if you have a great store, if you have great quality merchandise, if you know your target market, if you have great product market fit, chances are you sell a lot of stuff and you don't have a lot of returns. Fast forward to Black Friday. How many returns do you think you'll process on Black Friday? Returns. Not many, almost none, right? I mean, the, the returns can come later, right? But, but on Black Friday, you just sell. It's a lot, a lot of sales. 
But when you need to scale that monolith, you bring along a lot of extra baggage, a lot of dead weight. In this particular circumstance, that's considered dead weight because you don't need it, right? So you start looking at things like that and you think, how can I scale better? And that's when you light upon the idea of microservices, right? You tease out the functionality that needs to scale, that, that is widely divergent in the demand. And you bring that out, you extract that from your monolith, and you, you create the integration hooks and things like that. But you've got these, this microservice or microservices externalized now. Now, the first thing you realize once you do that is, hey, this is awesome. I can scale much better. I can just scale the stuff that needs scaled. But the second thing you realize is that it's not a microservice, right? You don't usually break out a microservice because what happens is if you have that ordering microservice, it's going to be interacting with what? A catalog, a shopping cart, again, your, your shipping, your, your credit, your things like that, your inventory levels. So you typically will extract and tease out a small cluster of microservices, which again is better than scaling the whole thing, but you start realizing that you've got some coupling going on that you didn't expect to see. And typically what happens when we, when we tease that functionality out where do we land first? HTTP-based interactions, right? So typically a REST API. And that's okay, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Again, everything has its pros and cons, but you find that when you have these various different services that are interacting, you typically, when you need to scale those, you scale fa fairly linearly with those as well because your ordering service will need to communicate with your inventory service and in order to process requests and responses you typically will scale if you need two of these you'll have two of these so they can interact right so you find that you're a little more coupled and a little more linear in terms of your scaling than you perhaps expected so um, not necessarily a bad thing again but it's certainly not the last stop on the the line so um, let's see do i want to yeah i'll go ahead and go in a little bit further here before i move on that's when you start looking for next level scaling and that's where messaging platforms come into being because, next, because messaging platforms offer you perhaps unequal scalability and flexibility. Uh, you have temporal decoupling, you have numerical decoupling, you have locational decoupling and I'll get into that very briefly as well. So when you have the microservices and I mentioned you scale fairly linearly among interacting microservices, if you have in the messaging platform a producer of messages, a producer of values and it's very prolific. It puts out a lot of messages, right? And you have a consumer on the back end that does extensive processing. One consumer may not be able to keep up with that one producer. So you, you create a second, or a third, or a fifth, or a tenth, or a hundredth. And it's fine, you're numerically decoupled. It doesn't matter. The producer doesn't care how many consumers are consuming those values, it just puts them into the pipeline. And conversely, the consumer doesn't care how many producers are producing the messages that it's consuming, it just says, oh, I have another one, right? which leads you to the, um, the temporal decoupling as well, because your producer, when it pushes a message into a pipeline, the consumer doesn't even need to be online at that point, right? The consumer may not even be online, and the producer just says, Here, here's, here's a value, and there we go, and I move on to the next thing. The consumer can come online later, and the producer may not even be online, but the consumer just says, look, I have a message, I'll process it. So that allows you a lot more flexibility in that regard as well. Locational too, because the consumer doesn't need to know or even care where that message came from. It just says, I have a message, it's mine, I've got it. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. Messaging platforms also give you crazy routing flexibility as well, which I'll, I'll hopefully get into as, as we go along uh, uh, too. Uh, but, but at a very high level, you can implement some very well proven and established patterns in terms of routing and, and uh, distribution of messages. And you may even come up with new patterns that haven't been discovered yet, but with, with messaging platforms, you have the ability to implement those in ways that you perhaps don't even foresee at this point. That's kind of nice as well. All right, so some examples. I'm gonna have to stop and, and take a drink here. I, I brought, I'm a two-fisted drinker here. I brought uh, water to soothe my throat and coffee to soothe my soul. So if you have them, drink them. Right now, the throat needs it more than the soul does, so <laughs> we'll go with that. Now, there are a lot of different messaging options, right? Uh, I always like to bubble it up to the, to the top ones, the, the first among peers. So I typically think of RabbitMQ and Kafka first, uh, but all the major cloud providers have different offerings as well. Again, even within those, I kind of bubble it up to the top one for each because we don't have all day. So things like Amazon Kinesis or Azure Event Hubs or Google's uh, Cloud Pub Sub, awesome options. By the way, none of those last three are open source. That may or may not be important to you, but I think it's important to, to point out. But RabbitMQ and Kafka, I consider even among those five to be the first among those peers. 
because those are, one, open source, two, can be run anywhere from your laptop all the way to bare metal servers, to VMs, to, to containers, uh, any cloud provider, any of your major cloud providers, or even hosted by their uh, shepherding organizations. So it gives you kind of that ultimate flexibility. They're also well tested and proven, right? So RabbitMQ is known for its crazy uh, flexible routing capabilities. Kafka is known for its throughput, uh, which by the way is a little bit misleading, right? Because uh, Pivotal and Google got together and said, let's see the extent of, of uh, the capabilities of Rabbit in terms of throughput and they clustered Rabbit and came up with, uh, and this has been like three or four years ago, it's only gotten better, but they, they found that, that uh, with a scaled Rabbit solution, RabbitMQ solution, you could actually process more messages per minute, hour, week, year, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's all the same measurement, than all of the text messages, SMSs, WhatsApp, and iMessage in the US. So I mean, it's, it's pretty scalable, right? So you don't typically think of Rabbit as being that crazy scalable, but it is. Kafka, the same way, you don't think of it as being as intensely routable. You know, it doesn't have the flexibility in routing, but you can get there. It's a little more complex than, than Rabbit, perhaps, but, but you can do it. So there's a lot of overlap there. Just point that out as an extra uh, kind of observation. So uh, with that, those are, I, to me, the big five. And again, the top two I consider to be Rabbit and Kafka, but your mileage may vary. Now. Wouldn't it be cool if we could all standardize on one solution? So if everybody went, Rabbit it is, or Kafka it is, or Kinesis it is, that would be amazing. Let's say your company has standardized on Kafka. That's great, right? Until your company buys another company, or is acquired by another company, or you have a partner or customers who are using Rabbit. Now what? Well, you're back in the integration game, right? <laughs> So while it's great to be able to standardize, we obviously need the ability to abstract above things and to be able to integrate with various different off offerings. And that's kind of where Spring Cloud Stream comes into being. Spring Cloud Stream is 100% open source, as is all of the Spring portfolio, but it allows you to work with all the various different messaging platforms and to do it in a way that in most cases, you can just do your job, work on the true business value adding capabilities. If you need to get under the hood and tweak the, the levers, that's fine, you can. But in most cases, as developers, what do we care about? We care about pushing a message into a pipeline, and I try to stay at a higher level terminology too, so I don't devolve into Kafka speaker, Rabbit speaker, whatever. But we try to concentrate on pushing messages into a pipeline and making sure they get where they need to be and then consuming them off that pipeline, right? That's 99% of our job. That's what we want to see happen. Obviously, sometimes we need to tweak things, but once we've got them tweaked, typically we just want to focus on making sure the stuff flows, that the information flows. And that's what Spring Cloud Stream allows you to do. It uses binders to do that. So it will point you to RabbitMQ or Kafka or Kinesis or what have you. And um, that's an incredibly powerful thing. In most cases, you can focus on that higher level. Um, Spring Cloud Stream is based on Spring Boot, which gives you auto configuration, simplified dependency management, ease of deployment based on Spring integration, which integrates with a large number of backend options. But of course, Spring Cloud Stream focuses on the messaging platform specifically. So you can focus again on the stuff you want and need to do. So um, I, I will say that, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'll have time to cover both, but any, any existing Spring Cloud Stream users out here? Wow, I'm kind of surprised. Usually there are a handful. I'm going to show you the existing API as it stands because I think it's very clear and compelling, but we're evolving it and it's actually getting to be a lot cleaner and more concise and very flexible and, and it eliminates some of the leaky abstractions that have been there in the past. Even though if you're used to them, it seems perfectly logical. When you start seeing it stripped away, you go, wow, that's clean, that's nice. So I'll show you both, hopefully. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> Again, kind of a summary of why I use it. Well, uh, it does most of the heavy lifting for you while still providing access to all the controls underneath. Uh, and again, 100% open source. On top of that though, no pun intended, maybe a little pun intended. Wow, tough crowd, okay. Uh, but if your environment does change, let's say your manager or CTO reads an article and says uh, everything has to move to Kafka or Kinesis or what have you, uh, you can switch messaging platforms by just rebuilding your project with a different binder. Or if you've planned ahead, and this is the fun part, you can do it dynamically, which is amazing. So if you planned ahead, if, you, if you're living that dream, if you have a CTO or a manager who switches entire architectural decisions underneath you overnight, 
you know who you are and I'm very sorry, I feel bad for you, but plan ahead and all of the, the pain or at least 90 plus percent of the pain can go away and we'll cover that as well. So, uh, the, I, I've actually evolved this talk from a kind of a popular talk that I did last year and I've given this talk now like three or four times, four times I think. <coughs> and I, uh, when I started doing this kind of talk, what I did was just start coding, which was a lot of fun. I had good feedback. But I got a lot of questions afterward that were like, okay, why did you do that? And where did this come from? And I felt like I was failing, right? Because I want, I, I think context is important. Anyone use Google Maps, Apple Maps? Yeah, everybody does. Come on, you know? <laughs> so, so when you type in your destination and it says, you know, directions, you hit directions, it, it does what? It provides context. It gives you the map. It shows you the, the little line. It shows you the step-by-step -step turns. That's context. And that's what this is. So today, here's our context. I'm going to start off by plugging in, uh, creating uh, some Spring Cloud Stream applications, some microservices, truly microservices, uh, with a messaging platform. And I'm going to start with Rabbit because I like Rabbit, but you know your mileage may vary. Uh, and I'm going to show kind of the power behind that using a source processor and a sync. Uh, in Spring Cloud Stream, there are three predefined interfaces: a source, a processor, and a sync, and it kind of makes sense. And you can create your own, by the way. You just create an interface with one or more subscribable channels and one or more message channels and Bob's your uncle, you're off and running. But in most cases, at 80 to 90% of use cases, you can assemble these various components that are already pre-built, you know, pre-predefined and create some pretty powerful routing, right? So you have a source interface, which a source is the thing that produces values, right? It's the source of values. You have a sync, which is the endpoint. It consumes values, that message is done, the life cycle is over, end of line. In between, you may have one or more processors, which is a transformer, right? It takes a value, it does something to it, and passes it on. And you can have multiple processors, you can route to different you know, sinks, processors, whatnot. Uh, so you can get pretty complex with this, but it's, when it all boils down, this is about as simple as it gets. I, technically, the simplest would be a source and a sink, right? But this is about as simple as it gets in using all three. Uh, we'll, we'll do some scaling, assuming we have time. If not, I'll point you to the repo and we'll go into it because that's dead simple, absolutely simple. Uh, but it gives you the ability to scale, well, any of them. I just like that way it presents. Uh, but sources, processors, sinks, your own. Uh, it's super easy, super, uh, super powerful, right? Because you can, you can scale out and scale back in by demand. Uh, if you need to switch underneath, so, hey, we've built everything on Rabbit. Now what do we do? Because our boss says we have to use Kafka. Uh, and that's not necessarily a problem, but how do you get there? It's not that traumatic. Uh, any managers in here? Any leadership? Okay, a few brave souls. Appreciate your, your, your bravery, your courage for raising your hand. Um, if at this point, when I get into the how to, how to flip between them, if you want to step out for just a couple minutes, that, that'd be awesome. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, it's, it really is super simple to switch between it. And I wouldn't encourage you to lie to your managers and take two weeks off or anything like that. That's terrible, don't do that. You lose all credibility. But it is truly, amazing how easy you can switch between the different options when you need to or, or want to. Uh, and then, of course, getting back to that whole integration thing, if you need to deal with multiple different underlying platforms, how easy is that? And the answer is very easy. So we'll, we'll cover that topic as well. Now, everything I've covered to this point kind of deals with the existing API, the legacy API, which still works and will work for the indefinite future, right? So if you have existing Spring Cloud Stream applications in production, all good. No worries. But I also want to show you the evolving, the new API, because I think that's where the future lies, right? If you notice, we have a source, a processor, and a sync. And we were, when we were working through this, we thought, you know, there are some abstractions from Spring integration that are kind of leaking through. Not necessarily a problem, but wouldn't it be nice if we could, could eliminate those? If we could focus on the things that we're trying to do and not necessarily the mechanisms behind them. And we realized that a source, a processor, and a sync correspond with Interfaces defined, functional interfaces defined in Java. A supplier, a function, and a consumer. A supplier does what? It supplies values, just like a source. A consumer does what? It consumes those values, just like a sink. And in between, you have a transformative function, which is a function, like a processor. So you'll, I'll, I'll get into that and show you that as well, and a few other useful bits and bobs if we have time. But let's get into the code. So let's see, I have 38 minutes, right? 28 minutes, that's ah, close enough. 38, 28, what's 10 minutes among friends? Uh, so does anyone recognize this, gentlemen? Maurice Moss, IT Crowd. If you haven't watched the IT Crowd, 
guess what? We have a weekend coming up. Binge it on Netflix. It's only two seasons. It's a Britcom. It's from the UK from like eight years ago. Awesome show. It's a little dated, but you will love it. I guarantee you. Well, I don't guarantee you, but I would, I'd be shocked if you didn't. So, all right. So let's go here. I'm going to mirror my displays because when I forget to do that, people look really confused. I don't know why. Uh, so here we go. Maximize that. Now we're going to start here. Why is this not? Oh dear. Okay. So once in a while, once in a while, my Mac just has a little fit. So let's try this. We'll do this manually. Look at that. And then I am back to where I can do it <laughs> with keys. Ah, I love the new Macs. Okay. So this is your starting point for Spring Boot, for building Spring Boot based microservices on the web. You don't have to start with the Spring Initializer. You can code them all by hand. Not the most productive use of your time, but you can do it. It's possible. You can also curl this, HTTP it. You can access it from your IDE. That's fine. Uh, I like to come here, but for a couple reasons. One, it's really pretty, right? And look, this is just so cool. So this has functionality like this, light UI, dark UI. Light, dark. Nice, huh? Yeah. If you, if you have, I, I mean, I, I joke, but it's, it's true. If you have everything set to dark mode and then you go to a site that's like, oh, my eyes, it's terrible. So I think it's kind of a nice feature. The other thing that's pretty nice, I'll, I'll show you in a moment, uh, but it's super nice to come here. If somebody asked me, why would I do that versus just using my IDE? I'll show you. Um, but we're going to build three services to start off with here today, and it'll just be that source, processor, and sync. I'm going to keep things fairly middle of the road here, but we can, you know, you can get exotic. And again, I'll throw you a bone at the end if you're, you're kind of thinking more along the Kotlin side of things. Uh, but I'm going to stay with Java and create a Maven project. Now, with uh, Spring, the Spring Initializer, you, can, you have options, right? <coughs> so if you're a Maven developer, if you like Maven for your build system, that's great. You can create a Maven project. Uh, if you're a hipster, you can create a Gradle project. It's your choice. You have the power. Uh, I'm not, I took off my hoodie already, so I'll just stay with, with Maven. I'm going to use Java. I'm going to use the current version of Spring Boot, current production version, which is 2.2.4. You can see you have other options, the newer milestone releases, snapshots, and then the older ones in the previous version, previous production version. Uh, I'm going to change this to the hecklers because I can. I'm going to create this as a source, uh, and I'm going to choose some options here. Now, we support we baseline at Java 8, right? So if you're, you're still on Java 8, that's fine, perfectly fine. However, we also support 11, which is the latest LTS release of Java, and 13, which is the current release of Java until, well, March, right? And then we'll support 14. So we always support the latest, greatest, as well as the long-term releases, and then, of course, the baseline of 8. Um, that's fine. I'm going to go up to 13 because I like 13. Actually, 11 gets me everything that I want to use, uh, but we'll just go 13 because why not? And then I'm going to bring in a few different uh, different dependencies. Uh, I'm going to I'm I'm those of you who know me know that I am a relentless optimist. So I'm going to bring in a bunch of stuff we'll probably not have time for, but who knows, right? So I'm going to bring in the dependency for reactive web. We probably won't have time to even dip into the reactive side of things. That's fine. We'll stay imperative. And if we have time, great. If not, we can talk later. Uh, but I'm going to bring in the dependency which gets me both reactive and imperative. So that's fine. Uh, I'm going to bring in my dependency for Spring Cloud Stream. If you notice when you bring in the dependency for Spring Cloud Stream, it says, hey, look, you're going to want to deal with a messaging platform or you wouldn't be choosing Spring Cloud Stream. But to do that, you need to bring in a binder for that specific platform. So for instance, RabbitMQ or Kafka. So since it's telling us that, we should probably do that. I'm going to bring in Spring for RabbitMQ. I'm also going to bring in Spring for Apache Kafka because I can't decide. I'm also going to bring in Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Lazy good, not lazy bad. Uh, anybody use Lombok? I like Lombok. I, I don't personally recommend it for use in production. Every time I say that, people cringe and go, we just put it in production. What's wrong with it? Nothing specifically, I guess. Uh, but Lombok has a, ha has a kind of history and a habit of breaking things on dot releases. Um, so I think it was 1.8.2 or something where they decided app value annotation would not create a Norx instructor. Probably fine, except all your build pipelines break, right? Simple to fix, very small, annoying. About the second or third time that happens, you think there has to be a better way. Anyway, do what makes you happy. I love it for demos because that way I can focus on the specifics I want to do. But if you're asking me what I typically do and instead, I use Kotlin. <laughs> so anyway, all right, so that's, we have Lombok. I'm going to bring in Actuator. 
because hopefully we'll have time for that, but if not, well, it was a good run. I'm going to generate the project. There we go, just gonna save that to my desktop. And that's my source. And then just to speed things along here, because again, uh, there's a lot I wanna show you. I'm gonna generate my processor, and then I'm gonna generate my sync. And we'll see where we go from there. And I'm just gonna unzip my source file here, my source project. Nope, nope, nope. There it is. And I'm gonna open that in my favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Anybody a NetBeans user? I do like NetBeans. Yeah. <laughs> I do like NetBeans. I pick on my friends, as, as my friends can tell you, which is why they you know, debate whether to show up at my talks. But, uh, but I, I do like NetBeans. NetBeans is an awesome IDE, which has great Spring support. It really does. Um, so if you're not using NetBeans, or if you are using NetBeans, that's, that's actually a good-natured rib. Uh, any Eclipse users? Uh, Eclipse is also a um, Eclipse is also an IDE. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not my favorite IDE, to be, to be clear, uh, but, but it is actually really good. We have a build of Eclipse called Spring Tool Suite. Uh, we have a language server which works with, with Eclipse as well as uh, Atom and VS Code. Uh, good stuff, it really is. And Eclipse, our Spring Tool Suite actually has some great, really cool cloud deployment capabilities baked in, which every time a friend of mine shows me, I go, oh, that's in there now, that's really nice. But for me, I like IntelliJ because I do some Kotlin coding, and the folks who make IntelliJ also lead the development of Kotlin. So as you might imagine, support is quite good. Um, whatever you use is perfectly fine, uh, even Vim, that's, that's okay. Just for whatever, whatever reasons, whatever you do, please do not use Emacs. Have some self-respect, okay? So we're gonna start here. Um, must be some Emacs fans in here, that, that hurts. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my application and our properties, I'm gonna go ahead and close this, and let's write, let's write some code. Now, anytime you do a demo, you, I, at least I, struggle with what can I do that's relevant? What can I do that people will, will relate to and enjoy? And they always tell you, like life advice, do what you love. I love coffee. So guess what, we're gonna talk coffee today. Um, last year I visited uh, Medellin, Colombia and got to tour a coffee farm. If you have, well, okay, first, does anybody in here like coffee? Yeah, a few, oh, that's good. If you don't, first, the first step is like coffee. Find some good coffee, drink it, and you'll be changed forever. Then the second step is go visit a coffee farm. It is transformative, it is life-changing. So I thought, after visiting this coffee farm, wouldn't it be cool if we created a series of services that would process or, or follow and guide the, the processing of coffee all the way from a coffee farm to a coffee roaster and packager to the coffee, to the baristas, right? The coffee bars where we get our, our, our go juice that we convert to code. And I thought this would be a great example. So that's what we're gonna do today. So uh, I'm gonna create a class here, class wholesale coffee, cause that's where we start. This is a little weird cause I have to lean up like this, but otherwise, and you probably have noticed, I'm probably blowing some people's minds, I'm not all that tall, right? And yet, with this, you'd, you'd have to do this, which is a little weird, so, so we'll, we'll deal. I, if I have typos, please, front few people, catch them before I hit build. Good, okay. So we're gonna create some wholesale coffees, so I'm gonna create just a very simple wholesale coffee, the ID and name, uh, if I can type. Wow, this is gonna be struggling. And again, I'm using Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. I'm gonna create this as a data class and I'm gonna have Lombok provide an all args instructor. A data class just means Lombok will give me my getters, setters, equals, hash code, and two string methods, and more, right? Uh, all constructor just says, hey Lombok, create a constructor with a parameter for each one of my member variables. So ID and name in this case. And Lombok dutifully does that. So that's kind of nice, right? Nice and clean. Uh, if you're a Kotlin fan, data classes, very similar, very nice. Now, since we're gonna, this is our source, we're gonna be creating and providing a lot of these different coffees. We could do that manually, but that sounds like a lot of work. I don't like work, I like to be efficient. So I'm going to create a component, if I can spell, and we're going to create a coffee generator to do our work for us here, generator. Now, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm gonna create a list of strings here. Come on, there we go. And we'll call this names, and these will be our coffee names, right? So these are our favorite coffees. Anyone have a favorite coffee? Blonde roast. Blonde roast, okay, that's good. Uh, by the way, a little trivia, very quickly. Which has more caffeine, light roast or dark roast? Light, yes, so, so a blonde roast is a highly caffeinated coffee. The more you roast it, the less caffeine you have. 
That said, I love a good earthy dark roast. So, I don't know, anyway. But blonde roast is awesome. Okay, anyone else? Colombian. Colombian, oh yes. Guess what I have in my bag? I actually have some, uh, some excellent Colombian coffee, some excellent Puerto Rican coffee. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna be a really good week. Yeah, anyone else? <laughs> I have a story about that. I'll put that in here, but if you want to know how, it, uh, this, the, the summary that too long don't read is people ruin everything, right? But I'll put that. Kopi Luwak is a different kind of coffee. If you don't know Kopi Luwak, see me afterward. Uh, anyone else? Okay, I'm from St. Louis. I travel a lot. I never spend much time there, but there is a, a uh, coffee there called Caldi Coffee. If I can type, there we go, Caldi. So that's quite a nice roast. Anyone? Anything Atlanta specific? Somebody was mentioning earlier, Jamaican Blue Mountain. Uh, I'll be going and getting some of that here shortly. That's not specific to Atlanta, obviously, but quite nice. Okay, we'll stop there. Okay, I just went dry all of a sudden. All right, so we've got some coffees. Uh, I'm also going to, because I like a bit of randomness, I think random is fun, so we're gonna create a new random and we're going to generate some coffees. We're gonna generate our wholesale coffees with a method called generate, cleverly enough, return new wholesale coffee. We'll use UID, nope, do, 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 UUID to generate a random UID, convert that to a string. We'll take our names, we'll get a particular name. We'll use our random to create or determine our next, uh, next int using our name's size, and that will generate us a random coffee. Not bad, right? Now we have the thing that's gonna generate the coffees. We have no way at this point to get them into the pipeline. So that's the next step. So we're going to do this old school or the current legacy API, right? So I'm going to first start off with enable binding and we're going to bind to our source, right? Uh, and then we will do some scheduling here. So I'm gonna enable scheduling because again, lazy. And then I'm going to create a class here called our coffee grower. And in our coffee grower, I'm going to inject our coffee generator so we can use that. Now, in spring, you can use field injection. But field injection is evil. There's a great article about this called Why Field Injection is Evil by Ali Dropbaum, who was our head of spring data for a long time. Then he turned it over to Mark Paluk. Still works in spring data, still a great guy. Go read it, it's a great read. So what we typically do is we use constructor injection, sometimes setter injection, but usually constructor injection. And we can write our own constructors or we can just say, hey, let, I'm lazy, I have Lombok, I'm just gonna have Lombok do it, right? So all our constructor, Lombok creates my constructor with a generator. So, uh, and actually I do want to do one other thing. I want to inject my source so I can access my source directly. And then let's, uh, let's do this. So I'm going to add schedule and a fixed rate of one per second. And I'm going to just do a send coffee here, right? That sounds like a plea for help. So I'm going to uh, just do, use my source, the output channel, send. I'm gonna use our friend, the message builder to create a message with the payload. I'm gonna use our generator to generate that and build the message and then we'll send it. Now, that's it. That's a pretty quick and easy way to create a source, right? Now, let's go ahead and create our properties that we'll use for our sensible defaults in our application.properties file. Uh, you can externalize these, and I'll show you that in, uh, in a little bit as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, but I'm going to just make the server port equal zero. In Spring Boot, what happens when it says server port equal zero is it looks for a, an available random port, and it assigns it. So you can just, I can create a dozen of these on my laptop, and they don't conflict. No port conflicts. That's kind of nice. And I'm going to map to my um, Spring Cloud Stream bindings my output channel, because this is a source. It has a predefined output channel. And my destination, I'm going to point this to a processor. This is just a pipeline name, right? So I'm gonna point this to processor. Now, I, if I just have a single binder and driver in my class path for, let's say, Rabbit, I don't need to specify the binder, but I have two, right? I have Rabbit and Kafka. So Spring Boot's auto configuration is gonna look at those and say, well, which is it? Which do you want? So I'm gonna say, well, I want Rabbit to start with. And that gets us started. I'm also going to specify some Kafka properties. So when we switch to Kafka, we've got that covered. And then uh, also our Kafka minimum partition count of four. The auto add partitions just says, hey, allow Spring Cloud Stream to create partitions as needed. So that's kind of nice as a developer to just let it handle it. 
And then I'm going to expose all of my management endpoints in Actuator. Probably won't have time to get into this, but here we go. Most of the time when I write code, I follow good practices because I think it's important to model good practices that you want to propagate through the community, right? I mean, we all try to do our best. Once in a while, I break all the rules for expediency. This is one of those times. Please, please, please do not do this at home. Uh, what this does is it completely opens up all of your actuator endpoints to anybody who wants to see them. Actuator contains a lot of your environment information. So any bad guy or bad gal can get in and see all the internals of your, your application, your, your, your beans that are loaded, your environment, your JDK and its version. I mean, it gives you a lot of specifics you probably don't want to expose. Actuator also integrates with Spring uh, Security. So you can expose limited things, you can secure different things, and that's all great. I'm doing none of that. I'm just opening it all. So don't do this at home, please, please, please. But for me, for today, it makes it expedient to do that. And actually, I just noticed that uh, is the wrong management. Management, uh, let's see. Did I bring in Actuator? That's interesting. Okay, so let's see, because that, that actually is not right. Hold on. Do, do, do. I did not bring in Actuator. Well, you know what? We're probably not going to have time to cover it anyway. What's that? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, let me just show you really quickly. We won't have time to get into this, but if you wanted to add it uh, after the fact because you did a silly thing like I did, it's super simple. Spring, um, boot, starter, actuator, there you go. So it's, it's that simple to add. And then if I go back to here, then I can just, uh, if I can type, management, endpoints, web exposure, include. There you go. So that will get you your all endpoints. But again, don't do that. Do as I say, not as I do. So we'll just, uh, we'll kill that for now. All right, so our source is complete. So let's go ahead and build out our processor and our sync, and then let's get the party started. So I'm gonna open that up. Our processor is a bit more complex because as you might imagine, it has to transform things, right? So we're gonna go first to our application properties, then to our application, and we'll start with our code here. Uh, and again, our source is providing values of what? So at data, at our constructor, and this is a wholesale coffee that it's going to be receiving. Wholesale coffee, spelling is important. String, ID, and name. And then we're going to transform this to what? We're gonna transform this to retail coffees, right? Class retail coffee. And again, we've got some of the same, same uh, properties here, so ID and name. But at this point, we're going to be transforming this coffee. So we're going to include a state because once we get the beans here, we're going to sort them, wash them, roast them, package them. And we may, before we package them, do something else. As sad as it makes me to say this, if we just package them, they're whole bean coffee, which is the way to do it, right? This is the way nature intended us to have coffee into our houses, bring it into our houses. So we can grind it right before we brew it. Wonderful. But there are some of us who travel a lot. We have a short time to get ready from the time we wake up to the time we hit the train. It's fine. So we're gonna also sell some ground coffee as well. So we have a state we're going to need to accommodate uh, when we send this coffee on to our coffee, uh, coffee baristas, right? So uh, we have a state, state, state. Okay, so now we just need to go to, there we go. And we're going to once again enable binding, in this case to our processor dot class. And this will be our coffee roaster, roaster. Again, I like random, so private final random, uh, R&D equals new random, and then, come on, there we go. So at this point, we have a stream listener. We're going to be listening to what? Our channel, our input channel, and then whatever we send out the other side, we'll send to our processor dot output channel, right? We're going to be outputting retail coffees. We're going to uh, process it, and we're going to be uh, bringing in some wholesale coffees to work with, right? So now return. Uh, and actually, I'm going to stop here. Let's see um, retail coffee. Our coffee equals new retail coffee. We'll use our wholesale coffees ID 
our wholesale coffee's name, and then we use our random next int. We have two states, right? So if that equals zero, we'll produce whole bean coffee. Otherwise, we'll produce ground coffee, right? And that's not terrible. And then we will take our, oh, actually, I should do this. And come on. Ah, come on, here we go. Interesting, okay, well, that's fine. So we, we've got that. So we'll do our coffee and we'll, we'll kick that out. Our coffee shortcuts for the win. And then return our coffee and there we go. So now we just go and add our properties, server.port0, string cloud stream bindings input, because this is a processor. So our destination in this case is called processor. That's what we're sending to from our source. We also want to define a group. We don't have to do this. So if we scale and we have two or five or 10 different consumers and they're not in the same group, everyone gets a copy of every message. That's called a fan out pattern. And when you need a fan out pattern, that's awesome. When you need to scale, not so much. So if we add them to the same consuming consumer group, we have a competing consumer pattern. That's what we're implementing. And that allows us to scale. They'll take turns processing. So if you have two consumers, they take turns, meaning you can roughly scale and accommodate twice as many messages. If you have five, 10, the same thing happens, right? Uh, we also, again, need to specify our binder. In this case, it's rabbit. Uh, and in this case, we have bindings for an output channel, right? So in destination, we'll call this sync. We don't need a consumer group here because it's producing on this channel, but we do need to again specify our binder, which is rabbit. And then for our Kafka uh, fun later, we want auto add partitions true and our minimum partition count four. And that's where we'll stop on that. So the next thing we need to do is create our sync. We have 10 minutes. This is going to be tight, but I think we can do it. So let's go here. We'll go to our application properties, application, and we'll start there. And again, in our sync, what we're going to be doing is receiving retail coffees. That's what our, our processor's outputting, right? Retail coffees. So uh, at data, at all our constructor, class, retail coffee. Pri uh, actually, we want to do an enum here for state, right? Whole bean and ground. And then we want a string ID and name and a state of state, super. All right, and then we want to enable binding to our sync. And this is our coffee drinker, right? And at this point, it gets pretty simple, right? We have a stream listener to our sync dot input channel, uh, void drink it. And we will be receiving retail coffees, our coffee. And let's see, so return system, oops, system dot out dot print line. And this would be our coffee. Yeah, so, uh, oh, silly, silly, silly. Okay, so getting ahead of myself. Server.port zero, Spring Cloud Stream bindings. Again, in this case, for a consumer, a sync, we have an input channel. Our destination is, once again, sync. We have a group, we'll call sync. And we'll have a binder, in this case, rabbit. And then again, when we go to Kafka, we want to have an auto add partitions true property and cloud stream Kafka minimum partition count four. All right, let's go ahead and kick this off. We have nine minutes to do a whole lot more, no problem. Okay, our sync is up and running. As you can see, it's connected. We've got a rabbit connection factory here. Everything's working there, so we'll go to our processor and we'll restart or start that, I guess. And then because I'm super confident in my ability to not typo and the front row hasn't stopped me, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my source and we'll run that. And we should see everything talk quite nicely. So as you can see, our processor is getting coffees. Looks pretty good, right? Let's make sure we're getting them in our sync. And of course our sync is getting them as well. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and just stop my source and we're gonna convert this to the new functional API, which I think is really, really clean and really nice. So I'm just gonna blow this away, right? Who needs that? So we're going to uh, create a configuration class 
don't have to do this. You can actually define your beans up here in your Spring Boot application, your main uh, application class, but I like to keep things kind of isolated, separate. Uh, so this is our coffee grower. And let's see, so private final coffee generator, generator, right? Uh, so we'll do an at alerts instructor to take care of that. And then, uh, let's see, so we need to define our bean. So everything is built around a few things. So we have a supplier bean, right? And this supplier is going to be supplying what? Wholesale coffees, send coffee. And this is pretty simple, right? So a supplier, if you look at supplier, you see that it's a functional interface with a single abstract method. Now since Java 8, what can you do when you have a functional interface and a single abstract method? Lambda, right? You can provide your Lambda as an implementation of that. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna return and we're gonna use generator.generate and that's so easy, right? And actually you can make it even easier. Look at this. Boom, method reference. It's just that clean. Now the only difference is when you get here, because it's the way we define our bindings, right? Oops, one more. So instead of an output, right? So we're gonna replace our output defined channel with convention. So we have an output channel we're gonna be referring to as our function, our supplier in this case. So send coffee, it has an output channel, and we have one channel, one, or one input at this point, or one, I should say output. <laughs> so you have one output at this point. But this gives you the ability to multiplex, right? So if you're talking about big data and things like that, you can have up to eight at this point, maybe more in the future. But instead of having a single channel defined as input or a single channel defined as output, you can have numerous channels that come in and go out, the gazintas and gazatas, which is a pretty powerful concept. So I'm gonna replace those, and that's really just as simple as that. So that's our, our, um, that's our um, supplier, right? So we go to our processor, and this gets even simpler here. So I'm going to replace the enable binding with just a configuration class. I'm going to get rid of this. And let's see, so I want to create a bean, right? And this will be a function that will transform my wholesale coffees to retail coffees. Come on, IntelliJ, keep up with me. There we go. Uh, and we'll call this um, uh, process it once again. And let's see, so actually I need to get rid of this. Boom, and uh, so this is a function. Once again, a function is a functional interface with a single abstract method. So return and we take our wholesale coffee and whew, typing's going downhill fast. So there we go. And nice. And then, well, still typos. There we go, much nicer. Okay, so we can leave this largely as is, but then we'll take our process it and once again, we'll go here and we'll replace our input with process it in zero because we only have one channel, right? And we go back here and we change our output channel to process it out zero. And that's pretty good. And then we go to our sync, same thing. We change this to a, an at configuration class. We change this to an at bean. And this becomes a consumer of retail coffees. Yep. Oh yes, come on, there we go. And then we can just do, once again, a lambda, right? So we take our coffee and we do a system.out.println of coffee. But again, method reference, so nice, right? So we're gonna change this drink it or input to drink it, right? So input to drink it in zero. Nice. Now, let's restart this. We'll go back to our processor, we'll restart that. Ah, oh, so much I wanna show you. We have three minutes, no problem. Okay, so the sync's working, the processor's working. Let's go and restart our source. Everything is working. Okay, so now I'm going to go and do, uh, let's see, let's make things kind of interesting. I'll wrap up on kind of a high note, but this will be, this will be, uh, this will be challenging to, to 
squeeze in, but we'll do it. I'm gonna change this to Kafka. It is truly that simple. So our sync will be listening to Kafka, right? Listening on a Kafka topic. I'm gonna to stop our source. I'm going to stop our processor. So our sync is still out there listening. We're gonna restart this so it'll listen to a Kafka topic. And then our source and our uh, processor are the same thing. We can just change these to uh, Kafka. That's no problem at all. But in this case, we're going to be passing things out via Kafka. I'm gonna leave this as, well, actually, I'm gonna change this to Kafka. So we've got that all set there. And then on our sync, same thing here. So everything, if we restart this, well, let's just do it, why not? And then while we're redoing that, I'm gonna go out here and let's see. So, oh, yeah, let's go with our source and Maven package. And then we'll go here, processor, Maven package. Look at that, okay. So everything is working here. We're all running on Kafka now, end to end. But what if we don't wanna do that? What if we need to mix things up a little bit? So I'm gonna stop my source. And the nice thing about this too, is that, and this is one of the things that I absolutely love to show, is that you can override things dynamically. So we have everything pointing to Kafka, right, with our config. But now I'm going to go out here to my processor and I'm going to do a java-jar target processor, right? And I'm going to do a dash dash and I'm going to cheat here a little bit. And I'm going to say that we're going to be listening to rabbit coming in, equals rabbit. We haven't overridden our property here for our output, so it's still gonna be sending things out on Kafka, but it's going to be listening to a rabbit exchange in queue, right? So we're gonna go ahead and start that up here. We're gonna to go to our source, and we're gonna do the same thing. So java-jar target source dash dash, and I'm going to go back to my source rabbit. Oh, Z shell, oops. Okay, so, love Z shell. Don't necessarily love having to put quotes around everything it can misinterpret. So, yes. So we're starting up our source. It's pushing values via rabbit. We're listening on rabbit to our processor and we did that all dynamically from the command line. So as you can see, you can actually do blue green deployments, canary deploys and override live and dynamically in real time. If we go back out to our sync, we see that our sync is still receiving them. So with that, let's go back and wrap up. And if you have any questions afterward, I'll be around all day and tomorrow. So some resources, Game of Streams is the repo out under my uh, GitHub account, MKHEC Game of Streams. If you wanna know more about Spring Cloud Stream, it's, there's excellent documentation out there. If you need to reach me, you wanna reach me, uh, marketthehecklers.com, mhecklervmware.com, but best of all is Twitter. If you have questions, comments, or feedback you don't wanna share with the world, my direct messages are open. Just ping me. Happy to hear from you. And if you are a Kotlin fan, Kotlin Repo too. Check it out. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>